easily the most unexpected and hottest exchange of her life. To say her mind didn't eventually shift to the kiss itself would be inaccurate, because Sam relived every second of that, too. She shifted uncomfortably as her body responded to memory. The softness of Hunter's lips when they'd pressed to hers coupled with the command of that mouth not long after. She could still feel its effects on every inch of her, torturously awesome and horrifically wrong, all wrapped up in the same event. She blew out a breath and stared at the ceiling. It was going to be a long night. When Samantha arrived at the savvy loft the next day, Mallory looked like she was ready to kick a baby penguin. Morning, she muttered to Sam and dropped a file folder onto her desk with a thud. Well, wasn't that the most cheerful greeting ever? Morning, Mal, she said tentatively. Do you need any coffee? You look like you need coffee. She was willing to make a Starbucks run if it would help Mallory not kill someone. Nope, I'll get some soon. Check your email. Will do. Samantha glanced at her watch. Just past eight and no one else was in yet, which made sense, as she was 15 minutes ahead of her own schedule. Possibly on purpose. She'd woken herself early that morning, gotten ready and left the apartment without encountering, well, anyone. Avoidance was a lame solution but it was all she had in her arsenal after the kitchen kissing. And God, she needed to talk about it with someone. But Brooklyn was the person she talked about those things with, and there was no way she could tell Brooklyn about the random kitchen kissing. Or about the way her stomach tugged pleasantly every time she thought about kitchen kissing. This really shouldn't be happening. Sam switched on her computer monitor and saw immediately that Mallory had sent an email to all three of them with instructions to pause all work for Foster Foods. Whoa. In other words, their biggest project. This didn't bode well. She peered around her monitor and stole another glance at Mallory, their fearless leader, who in this moment sighed deeply and shuffled a few dozen sheets of paper around. Still in penguin-kicking mode, Samantha decided. Something was most definitely up. Coffee delivery girl, Brooklyn practically sang as she slid open the door. I'm here to make morning dreams come true via caffeine. The coffee fairy didn't forget us, Mal, Samantha said as Brooklyn deposited a plain latte on her desk. Yay, Mallory deadpanned. Morning, Sammy Sam, Brooklyn kissed her cheek with a smack. And she's in a good mood, again. Brooklyn inhaled and smiled. That I am, because I had a fantastic night. Translation, she got laid and was all sparkly because of it. It had been a constant sparkle ever since she and Jessica had entered official couplehood back in December. It was cute at first. Not so much anymore. But maybe she was just in a bad place. Almond latte for Mallory, Brooklyn said, delivering the drink. With your name spelled correctly, I didn't even have to tell them. Ah, oh, thanks, Mallory said without taking her eyes off her screen. Brooklyn turned to Samantha with a raised eyebrow, to which Sam could only shrug back. Brooklyn pressed on. A cafe mocha for me and an Americano, she stared at Hunter's empty desk with absolutely no home. Your roommate's missing, what gives? Did you murder her over mail placement? Absolutely no murdering. Sam glanced behind her, feigning nonchalance, as if she hadn't noticed Hunter's absence at all, when in reality, she was acutely aware. Huh, that is interesting. Probably on her way down. Probably. Brooklyn said, dropping off said Americano on Hunter's desk anyway. Check your email, Sam whispered. It wasn't long before she heard a murmured, What the? 
from Brooklyn's desk. Mal, are you planning to elaborate on this email? Mallory swiveled around to face Brooklyn. Just waiting till we're all here, and then I'll go over what I know. Go get her, Brooklyn said, addressing Sam. Drag her out of bed if you have to. I don't care if she was out late. Okay, the concept of walking into Hunter's bedroom and throwing the covers off her barely dressed body didn't sound like a wise idea at all. Not good for the whole avoidance tactic. Nope. The kitchen kissing had trumped any kind of expectation of rational, mature behavior. This was the panic zone, where it was every girl for herself. She'll be here soon. It's just now 8.20. Relax, coffee fairy. I'm texting her. Brooklyn fell back into her chair dramatically. And the office once again lapsed into silence. Samantha busied herself in deposit slips. Mallory tic-tacked away on her keyboard, and Brooklyn stared at the wall, which meant she was doing that creative thing. At long last, the door slid open and Hunter made her way in. Brooklyn stood. Finally, can we discuss this now? She asked Mallory. What are we discussing? Hunter asked easily. Morning, guys. Her hair was in a low ponytail, and she sported an army green button-up that she'd left untucked atop black leggings and lace-up boots. She looked fresh and chipper, as if she'd just had the most restful sleep of her entire life, which just irked Samantha further, as she'd clocked maybe 45 fitful minutes. We're discussing why we're halting all work on the foster account. Mallory said, already heading into the kitchen where they could meet around the table. Well, that's news, Hunter said, dropping off her stuff and picking up the Americano. She held it up in Brooklyn's direction questioningly. You're welcome, Brooklyn said sweetly, heading to the table before stopping and regarding Sam curiously. You're in my seat. Why are you in my seat? This is strange. You like everything to be exactly the same. The reason for the seat switch was that her own seat was across from Hunter, and the concept of staring across the table at her during the meeting, or the opposite, forcing herself to look away, was too daunting to deal with and too difficult a problem for this morning. But she wasn't about to explain that to the room. Instead, she shrugged. I'm trying something new. Spontaneity. Her friends exchanged looks. Hunter sent her a small smile and shrugged in a way that seemed to say, Good morning. Last night was no big deal. But that wasn't a sentiment she shared. Because while she wanted the world to go back to normal, desperately she did. One cannot simply unkiss her best friend. And as her thoughts began to take off on a panic-laced tangent, Mallory's words roped her back into the here and now. Foster Foods filed Chapter 11 late yesterday. Samantha ran that sentence back through her brain one more time. It still didn't add up. I'm sorry. What did you say? No fucking way, Hunter said, leaning back in her chair. So they're done? Gone? Brooklyn placed a hand over her mouth in devastation. Mallory held up one finger. Not exactly. Apparently, some really bad business moves have dropped them on their ass financially. But Royce Foster isn't going down that easily. They're working on restructuring their debt. What does that mean for us? Brooklyn asked with the hopeful eyes, reminiscent of a Disney princess. It means we're on hold. We may lose their business altogether, and if so, that means we need to replace it. It means I need to hustle. Brooklyn and Hunter need to dazzle on the creative so much that our current clients can't get enough of us. And Sam needs to make some money magic happen so we can stay in the loft despite the crazy rent hike. That might mean a whole new monthly budget, starting from scratch. But the larger problem settled over Samantha, and she met Mallory's gaze grimly. We're not getting paid on those outstanding invoices, are we? 
The subtle shake of Mallory's head caused Sam to inhale at what a blow that would be. They'd been floating Foster's bill for several months now on good faith, thinking they'd just gotten caught up in the paper clog of a large corporation's accounting department. But she'd been counting on that money. The four of them spent the majority of their time working on Foster projects. And now, with the rent so much higher, she didn't know how in the world they were going to have done all that work for free. This is bad, Sam said to Mallory, and then proceeded to explain to the others the outstanding invoices, the true state of things. How is that possible? Brooklyn asked, infuriated. We did that work. We deserve to be paid. It's possible we still might be, Mallory said, but it probably won't be for a while. So, you're saying we need to step it up a little to split the difference? Brooklyn asked. That's what I'm saying. Brooklyn sighed. Okay, but can I just say that this sucks? I think we're going to need Afternoon Pinkberry to survive this. The s'mores kind. I nominate Hunter to go get them mid-afternoon. The counter girls love her, and then we get extra toppings. I second this idea. That's why we keep you, Mal said to Brooklyn. Just earning my keep, boss. Hunter stood and gave a nod, an easy smile. I accept my mission. See, that right there annoyed Sam. The cavalier attitude. The mission to make girls swoon. It was whatever. Samantha resisted a visible eye roll, but she definitely participated in one internally. As Brooklyn and Mallory headed back to their desks to work on the accounts still in play, Hunter lingered in the kitchen with Samantha a moment longer. Maybe we could talk later about last night. Samantha felt her cheeks redden, suddenly on the spot. Um, sure, of course, if you want to. I do. Samantha stole a sideways glance across the office and dropped her voice further. But not here. I don't want to involve. Hunter's eyes widened instantly. No, definitely not. We can talk tonight, just us. Perfect. I'll be home. Hunter nodded. And I'll be home too. Great, both home, so we can talk. And we will, Hunter said. See you then. Hunter hesitated. I mean, I'll see you around the office first. And I'll be getting you Pinkberry later, so... Right, Sam said, jumping in. We'll both be around, probably. God, this was the most awkward ever. Sam hated it. But tonight is best. Yeah. Hunter turned on her heel and headed back to her desk, cursing herself and her inability to speak to Samantha like a functioning human. Maybe it was because Sam was in her relaxed mode today. She wore a navy blue shirt and red short-sleeved knit top with her hair down and luxurious. She looked great and thereby Hunter was apparently relegated to 16 years old and tongue-tied. But damn it, she wasn't even like that when she was 16. Where the hell were her moves? She'd been a stammering, staring idiot. Four hours later, she put herself to test at Pinkberry. Hunter, right? The girl behind the counter grinned widely. It was the same girl from last time. Blonde, shoulder-length hair, with a stud through the top of her ear and a smiley face tattoo on her right wrist. That's right. And you're Kayla? Hunter was great with names. It was a skill she'd picked up early in her flirting career. This seemed to make the girl infinitely happy. How is your day today? Kayla asked. I've had better, but it's starting to look up now. Oh, yeah? She inclined her head, employing the head-tilt direct eye contact combo that always seemed to elicit a blush. Definitely. Wait for it. One, two, 
three, and full-on blush. Perfect. She could feel her confidence crawling its way back to her. So, what can I put together to make your day even better? Kayla asked. Three medium s'mores for my friends, and a watermelon cooler for me. Light and refreshing on a warmer day, you know? Kayla stared at her for a moment before snapping to attention. Right, yes, I definitely know. She wiped her forehead. It is warm in here, isn't it? I meant outside. Kayla looked stricken. Of course. But I'm starting to feel the heat you mentioned. A second blush. Perfect. Kayla gave her head a little shake. I'll get your order ready. Thanks, Kayla. You're my favorite. Oh, and my friends wouldn't mind extra chocolate chips. I mean, if you have any to spare. Any time, Hunter. Just ask for me next time. I'll get you set right up. As Hunter walked from Spring Street back to the loft with the bag containing four small frozen yogurts, she did so with a confident stride. It turned out she wasn't broken after all. She just seemed to lose her power around one particular person. Not a major crisis, just something she would work on. All I'm saying is that you don't have to follow me into every room. You probably have stuff to do. Elvis stared up at Samantha in response, his stubby little tail thwacking back and forth. Listen, you're very handsome. I concede this. But I already scratched your ears and your stomach and tossed that fake newspaper for you like eight times since I've been home from work. And it was kind of a hard day. We lost a major client, Elvis. You feel me? So what more can I do for you? Elvis upped the ante, and now it appeared that his entire body wagged. Yes, you're adorable, and I really, really like you. But I don't know how to help you further. Your mom should be home soon. She turned and walked through the door to her bedroom, Elvis still at her heels. This dog came with a lot of pressure. He had apparently developed some sort of affinity for her, and his attention, while complimentary, was not something she was used to. She didn't know quite what he needed. But she was tempted to offer him a cocktail. Lord knows she could use one. As Elvis looked on from the spot he favored on her bed, she changed from her work attire into her denim capris and a heathered pink t-shirt and scrunched up her toes in celebration of no work shoes. She then went about making some pasta and pesto sauce in the kitchen the same kitchen she'd had her world rocked in just hours prior. She tried not to dwell on the world rocking. Midster, the door slid open and Hunter strolled in, her messenger bag diagonal across her body. Hey, she said to Samantha. Hi, want some pasta? I definitely do. That smells amazing, what is it? Hunter bent down to greet Elvis, kissing his face, and slid her bag off her shoulder. Solve all the world's problems today, Elvis. You're helping Samantha cook, I bet. You excel at cooking. He's okay. Honestly, he could do a little more stirring and a little less staring. She inclined her head to the pot. And that is pesto sauce. And a specialty. My mom passed it down. Okay, good. This was feeling fairly normal. And she so needed normal right now. Anything I can do to help? Grab some plates. Hunter did as she was told and set the table for them both. So, that was crazy today. The foster deal? Samantha shook her head. I just wish we'd had more warning. I would have been more conservative with last month's receivables, you know? Hunter shook her head. I don't know how you do it. Do what? Money magic. My mind just doesn't work that way. Sam set the bowl of pasta on the table next to the salad she'd thrown together. But mine does. Keeps things interesting. She shrugged. 
I like the black and white of it, the structure. It's something I can control. You like to be in control of things, that's for sure. What? And you don't? Hunter leaned back in her chair. I think we can both agree that I'm a little more go with the flow. That's true. You do your laundry on whatever day of the week you want. It's barbaric. Yeah, well, don't tell anyone. Samantha sat a bit taller. Sunday is for washing clothes. It's the perfect day for it. Of course it is. And on the seventh day, God did laundry. Everyone knows this. Sam laughed. You're teasing me again. I have to, you know this. That part's true. As they settled into dinner, Sam was smiling, because things seemed to be falling back into place. She and Hunter had reclaimed their easy rhythm, and it felt so comfortable that Sam relaxed for the first time in 16 hours. Plus, she'd poured them each a glass of Merlot, so that helped. And God, the sauce had turned out great. She should open a sauce shop. Sam's Sauce. She'd rock sauce sales. As they ate, Hunter glanced over at her thoughtfully. I dare you to change it up. Samantha raised a curious eyebrow. You dare me to change what up? Do your laundry on Thursday this week. You mean, take a walk on the wild side with you? You might like it, Sam. Hunter smiled, and Samantha felt it right in the center of her stomach. Maybe, but I also happen to like my life as it is. My routine helps me stay focused, keeps my life together. Hunter stared back at her in challenge, and Sam made note of the fact that Hunter's eyes were probably her most expressive feature. Big, and the softest brown imaginable. She also had the most elegant neck, slender and smooth, leading down her body to curves that could not be ignored. As tough as Hunter seemed, as cool and charming as she often was, there was something innately soft and feminine about her that Samantha loved. Hunter came with a lot of layers. Is that a no to the laundry challenge? Oh, right. There had been a conversation in progress. Fine, I'll swap up my laundry day. But what do I get in return? Hunter stared back at her knowingly, a small smile playing on her lips. And just like that, Samantha felt the color enter her cheeks at the unspoken insinuation. Her world skidded wildly off-center once again. Damn it. We should probably talk about last night, Hunter said. The teasing smile faded from her lips, the deal temporarily forgotten in favor of the larger issues. Okay. That was about all Samantha could manage. The room now felt small, and she wasn't quite sure what to do with herself, with her hands. So she began to straighten up clearing things from the table and setting them across the island to wash. It was bad of me, kissing you like that. Sam stopped what she was doing and turned to listen. I was half asleep and, well, I hope you'll accept my apology. It wasn't exactly an explanation, and as much as Sam wanted to move forward from this, she needed one. What made you do it? Sam watched Hunter take a deep breath before meeting her eyes with reluctance. Because, in that moment, I couldn't imagine not doing it. You were so beautiful standing there, the moonlight playing in your hair. Stunning. So I... acted. Samantha's lips formed a tiny O, oh, but no sound escaped them. She couldn't remember the last time someone had called her stunning. It hadn't been what she'd expected to hear, and that stripped her momentarily of her trajectory. Hunter continued. I didn't tell you that to make you uncomfortable, but you did ask. No, I did. I just... 
Finally, Sam found her footing and said what her mind was thinking. Really? You thought that about me? Hunter nodded, knowing full well it was a bold move. The honesty. But when asked the question, she couldn't quite bring herself to sidestep the truth. Because it wasn't some girl from a bar asking. It was Samantha. Samantha, who knew her better than most people on the planet. As Sam stared at her, Hunter felt a prickle of heat in her cheeks. Sam glanced at the wall in mystification before shaking her head and meeting Hunter's gaze. I thought you'd maybe been sleepwalking. I was awake. And then, because they were being so honest, Hunter took it one step further. What made you kiss me back? At the question, Sam resembled a terrified puppy, just as Hunter opened her mouth to let her off the hook. She got her answer. Well, you happen to be a really good kisser. Hunter laughed. She hadn't seen that one coming. Yeah, well, right back at you. Samantha walked around the island toward Hunter. It can't happen again. You know that, right? It would ruin everything that's important. Hunter placed her hand over her heart. I do, and it won't. It was a moment in time. Our moment. And then she grinned. We'll always have the kitchen, Sam. Samantha tossed a dish towel at her playfully and then covered her eyes with one hand. I cannot believe you just said that to me. I'll never look at white grape juice the same way again. Sam gasped. You have to stop or I will be forced to kill you. This is embarrassing enough. But she was laughing, and that was good. You can't kill me. You adore me. Samantha stopped her advancement, her expression now sincere. Now that part is true. You know that, right? I do. A pause. Leave the dishes for me. You made our dinner. I'll clean up. Roommate points. You sure? Yep. Hunter glanced at the sink. I'm an amazing dishwasher. Prepare to be impressed. I can hardly wait. While you do that, I'm off to Queens. Hunter smiled at Sam's once-a-week volunteer gig at the retirement community. Say hi to Mr. Earnhardt for me, and see if you can snag his lasagna recipe. He swears he's taking it to his grave, but I'll see if I can sweet-talk him. I have faith in you. Hunter put on the eagles and went to work scrubbing the pots and plates they'd used for dinner. She was pleased with the kissing debriefing and felt they'd both handled the delicate situation quite well. They'd even laughed about it, which was just absolute bonus. Her phone buzzed in her pocket and she automatically assumed it was April. They had plans to get together at nine just after April's final class. She'd thought about canceling, but the distraction was much needed. But instead of April's face smiling up at her from the screen, she saw her mother's instead. Hi, Mama. Hello, angel girl. Are you eating? Right now? No, we just finished dinner. Why? No, in general. You look too thin on the Facebook thing. It concerns me. Hunter smiled. Her mother was new to social media, but was definitely making up for lost time. I haven't lost any weight, Mama. I promise. What photo are you looking at? I don't know. You were tagged by a girl named Stacy who has her arms around your waist. I hit like, but I didn't really like it at all. She's just a girl from a club I was at, Mama. I don't really know her that well. She wants to know you, that's for sure. If you didn't know her, don't let her up against you like that, Nani Kaikamahine. Everyone on the face place is going to think she's your girlfriend. My Maijong group will see and think there's a wedding. Hunter smiled. You're right, I'm sorry. She knew when to pick her battles. Her mother was the sweetest person on planet Earth, 
but she came with a rock-solid set of morals and values that she expected her children to adhere to as well. And while Hunter did her best, she sometimes felt there was an unavoidable generation gap. Plus, her mother had never lived in New York City. I'm calling about your father's birthday this weekend. It's going to be more of a celebration than I originally thought. We're having a party for him at the NCO club on base. All of our friends are coming. Oh, yeah? She didn't see why this had to involve her just because the location had changed. It would mean a lot to the family if you came. There will be pictures, and every time I look at them, my middle baby will be missing. Hunter dropped her head back and stared at the ceiling. Not this again. If she knew him, her father would actually prefer it if she didn't show up. It would be the best birthday present she could possibly give him. Why put herself through that and spend a weekend angry and resentful all over again? He doesn't need me or want me there, Mama. We both know this. If anything, it would just cause problems. He'll make some sort of passive-aggressive comment. I'll take offense and fire back. Nothing good ever comes from us being in the same room. You'd have photos of angry people. That's not true. I still hold out hope that you and your father will see eye to eye someday. Underneath it all, he's a good man. He just has trouble communicating sometimes. And accepting his children as they are, Hunter wanted to supply. But her mother was caught in the middle, and that couldn't be an easy place to reside. She should cut her some slack. I don't think it's going to work out this time. Plus, last-minute flights are hard to snag. I'll come on a different weekend. How about next week? She knew her mother was craving a visit, and if she dangled an impending trip in front of her, it might get her off the hook. Her mom paused in defeat, not taking the bait. It matters to me that you're there. I want all three of my children present together when our friends and family come out to celebrate. You're coming. You'll find a reasonable flight. I'm your mama, and that's what I say. What could she do here? Feeling as though her hands were tied and wanting to do whatever she could for her mother, she blew out a breath. Fine, I'll be there. I love you, Hunter. Be good. I love you too, Mama. I will. Chapter 7 Sam arrived at the Balmy Days Senior Center ten minutes late. She'd hopped the L train to Queens, but due to maintenance on the track, they'd been delayed and forced to transfer at the last minute. When she'd arrived, she was met by the usual suspects. All concerned, she wasn't going to make it for their scheduled scrapbooking class. Samantha had begun volunteering at the retirement home three years prior, and since that time had developed a steady following of residents who looked forward to their time together. While she tried to work up a variety of activities for them to participate in during her time with them, scrapbooking quickly emerged as their clear favorite. If there was one thing elderly people seemed to like to do, it was reminisce about the past, and organizing their old photos seemed to serve that purpose nicely. Sorry I'm late, everybody, Sam said, sliding her bag off her shoulder. Subway trouble. Mr. Turner nodded gruffly, but unfolded his arms. That was a start. Mrs. Leinhart clapped. Well, at least we can get started now. Thank God you're all right, Mrs. Swinetech said, patting her shoulder. The others headed off to the recreation room, ready to get moving. An hour later, with remnants of a glue stick all over her fingers, she moved about the room, helping each resident as best she could. She looked forward to the time she spent at the senior center and loved her little group even if they did bicker with each other incessantly over who was dating whom or what the cafeteria should really look into serving. But one thing was clear. They all seemed to adore Sam. Even Mr. Turner, 
who'd rather eat paper than admit it. Regardless of his stern demeanor, he showed up voluntarily each week and quietly assembled his own scrapbook of mementos from his life. Samantha, dear, do you have any glitter? I'd like to add some glitter to my single girl page. Make me a little bit of a rock star. Sure, Mrs. Gauducci. What color would you like? Mrs. Gauducci had recently added a pink streak to her white updo, in response to Mrs. Potter asking Mr. Glenville to sit with her in the dining hall. It was all a very big deal, and still a bit touchy. Well, since I'm going for more of a hussy vibe with this page to accentuate my swinging single years, what would you recommend? Swallowing her smile, Samantha selected a deep purple and handed it off. Samantha, dear, have I ever showed you a photo of my sweet Martha and me on our honeymoon? Mr. Earnhardt asked. I don't think so, Mr. Earnhardt. She crossed the distance to his workstation and stared at the black and white photo of the young happy couple standing next to a sandcastle on the beach. Mr. Earnhardt had lost her five years ago to cancer. Oh my, she's beautiful. Mr. Earnhardt beamed at her words and looked back at the photo. She was the prettiest girl in all of time. I think I'm going to give this photo its own page. Spotlight it some. Samantha smiled. That sounds like the perfect idea to me. How about some beach die cuts? I have some in my supply bin. It would be nice if you had one of the sun shining brightly. I'll see what I can come up with. The two-hour session seemed to fly by, but by the end of it, each of the residents had made much progress on their project. As Sam packed up all of the scrapbooking paraphernalia, her most dedicated gang of troublemakers hung close. When are we going to get to meet your girlfriend, Sam? You told us you'd bring her with you one day soon. Samantha hesitated, closing her eyes briefly at the still painful Libby reminder. I did say that, but unfortunately she's not my girlfriend anymore. We broke up. Tramp, sweet Mrs. Swintech shot. Sam's eyebrows rose in response to the otherwise grandmotherly woman. You're better off without her, then. Burn her stuff. Oh, wow, thanks. But it's not her fault. It just wasn't meant to be. You'll find someone better, Mr. Earnhardt said. Sam sighed and fastened the lid on the box of supplies she stored in the closet. Maybe someday. Well, if she can't visit, maybe you could bring back those friends you work with sometime. They were very nice girls. Samantha smiled. The residents craved visitors, and she did what she could to bring folks in to see them. Mallory, Brooklyn, and Hunter had been great about stopping in every now and then, sitting in on her classes and helping as best they could. Now that is a definite possibility. I like the blonde one. She's the most fun, Mrs. Gauducci said. Mr. Glenville raised a finger. I think the dark-haired exotic one should come back. Mrs. Gauducci scoffed and muttered under her breath. Babelicious. Excuse me? Sam said, looking in question from Mrs. Gauducci to the others. What does Babelicious mean? It's what these men call your friend. Downright disturbing, if you ask me, she grumbled. Bunch of old men chasing after a girl her age. We're not chasing after her, Mr. Earnhardt corrected. That would be impolite. We just like it when she's here, and we can see her. Sam couldn't hold back the smile. You call Hunter Babelicious? Mr. Glenville shrugged sheepishly. Sam laughed. I'll have to remember that one. 
Can I order you another? Hunter asked April, gesturing to her dwindling glass of Merlot. Not feeling wine herself, she'd gone with a vodka tonic and could already feel the day slide off her. She was relaxed, at ease with April, and feeling like herself again. It had been a good idea, this little late-night get-together. They'd met at a tiny little French bistro in the meatpacking district, not too far from the gym where April had just finished with work. They were the only table in the place, but then again it was after ten on a weeknight. Oh, no, thanks, April said, holding up the glass. One is my limit during the week, trying to stay on the fitness train as best I can. I'm happy you called. I don't know if I said that already, but it's true. Hunter smiled. April had a tendency to repeat things. It was kind of endearing. Me too. I needed to get out tonight. This is perfect. April tilted her head to the side and studied her. So, what's your story? My story? Well, I work in advertising, graphic art more specifically. Recently moved from just down the street, here, to Soho. It's an artist's loft, so I can live and work in the same building due to zoning allowances. I have a dog, I'm into yoga, and work with my three best friends. And date a lot of girls along the way. Who told you that? Just a hunch. You're way smooth. Thank you for catching that. It was light, their banter. They'd settled further into the place and traded stories about their days. April was funny and good-looking and seemed to have a head on her shoulders. But she was nervous, that much Hunter picked up on. Luckily, she knew how to help. She dipped her head and met April's eyes. You're very pretty, you know that? It wasn't a lie. April's gaze fell to the table before it bounced back up. Thank you, but you don't have to say that. I don't, and wouldn't, in fact, except that you are. April placed her elbows on the table and leaned her chin on her hands. This is our third encounter, you know. Hunter hadn't been counting. She sipped her drink casually. Is it? Mm-hmm. Class, the park, and now drinks. Three's a good number. April glanced at the bartender and offered him a head nod. Hunter saw where this was going. I live just around the corner. Do you want to walk me to my door? I was just about to offer. They were definitely on the same page. Twenty minutes later, and Hunter was taking in the small but cozy one-bedroom apartment April had off 21st. It seemed they'd been practically neighbors until Hunter moved to the loft. The compact living room was simple, a no-frills kind of place. Comfy beige sofa, red chenille blanket, some rather awesome art above the small dining table. Is that one of Joe Allen's? She asked, admiring the wall-mounted metal sculpture. It is. An original I was lucky enough to snag before he blew up. Right place, right time kind of thing. I don't know anyone who knows Alan's work. Your cool points just increased exponentially. I live for cool points, April said in her ear from behind. And now you know someone familiar with Alan. That makes you awesome. You realize this. I'll have to find a way to live up to awesome. Oh, hey, I have an idea. Her arms slid around Hunter's waist and she pressed her body to Hunter's tightly. Hunter turned and traced the outline of April's cheek with one finger. She'd always been one for a little build-up before going in for more. April? Not so much, apparently. She caught Hunter's mouth and kissed her hungrily. No preamble needed. Well, to each her own. April's hands were on Hunter's waist and moving up her ribcage clearly on a mission. Hunter smiled into the kiss, 
at April's tenacity. It had been a while since Hunter had had sex. Well, a while for her, anyway. She was ready to put an end to that streak. She took control, moving them down the hall to where she imagined she'd find the bedroom, all the while checking in with herself, taking stock. Okay, so she wasn't exactly on fire, but maybe she just needed time. April halted their progress, and without breaking the kiss, backed Hunter up against the wall just outside of the bedroom with a thud. It should have been hot, except it wasn't. It had been a little painful. God, you're beautiful, April murmured against her skin as she transitioned her attention from Hunter's lips to her neck, placing hot kisses there as her hands wandered lower. Hunter exhaled slowly and gave her head a little shake in an effort to focus on the action, lose herself in the sensations that should be overtaking her body soon. Yep, any second now. But nope, not a go. Maybe if she closed her eyes, stopped trying so hard. April slipped her hands underneath the back of Hunter's shirt and cascaded fingers across her skin at the small of her back. But the contact had little effect on her. In fact, she felt altogether removed from the encounter. She just couldn't seem to get there. Never one to give up. She reached down and brought April's lips back up to hers and reversed their positions in a move that should make the difference. She liked being in charge, so why not capitalize on that? As she kissed April, she used every technique in her arsenal, and it seemed to be working. On April, who let out a quiet murmur of appreciation. Hunter smiled at the encouragement, but with her eyes still closed, Another image slipped into the mix. It was Sam, sitting at her desk. Serious money glasses on, ponytail in place, smiling at her, those green eyes dancing. And that was it. Fuck. She blinked to clear her head, released April, and took a step back. April touched her lips at the loss and studied her curiously. You okay? You look a little pale. Hunter didn't answer right off, unsure of what had just happened. Why was she so totally thrown? Her mind and body were refusing to engage when there was a gorgeous woman, who she liked very much, ready to rip her clothes off. I'm sorry, I don't know why, but my head is in a weird space tonight. April looked sympathetic. Yeah, well, I think I can help. Maybe you just need to relax. She stepped into Hunter's space and kissed her jaw. Take a break from the rest of the world. Yes, God, that was exactly what she needed. April was right, and she wanted this to happen. She did. Her refocused lips were on April's, and they were back in business. But no sooner had she congratulated herself then she flashed on Sam laughing, as she had earlier that night at dinner. Yeah, this wasn't going to happen. She pulled her lips from April's and placed a soft kiss on her forehead. I'm sorry. Please don't hate me. But I think I'm going to have to take a rain check on tonight. The look of rejection on April's face caused her stomach to drop. It has nothing to do with you. You're the coolest, sexiest girl I've met in a long time. I mean that. I'm just not feeling great. April nodded and offered a half-hearted smile. It's okay, I understand. And then changed modes, eager to help. Can I get you an aspirin or some water? Do you want to sit down? Hunter straightened the items of clothing that had been unstraightened in their makeout session. No, you've been more than great. I think I should just head home. I'll be fine. Hunter made a move for the door, eager for fresh air, anything to help her rebound emotionally, but turned back at the last minute. April. Yeah? You're great. 
I just want you to know that. April blew out a breath and smiled genuinely. Thank you. As Hunter waited for the train, the series of events played again in her mind, and the more she went over them, the angrier she became. It wasn't cool how she'd walked out on April, and it wasn't okay the way she'd let herself be so overtly affected by Samantha. And what the hell was that, anyway? Since when had one woman been able to influence her time with another? By the time she arrived back at the loft, her coping skills were at an all-time low, and she felt like she was in a fucking tailspin. Hey, you're home, Sam said from the living room chair. She was watching some sort of show from the 1960s, which was such typical Sam behavior. With a flick of the remote, Sam turned off the TV and centered her attention on Hunter. How was your night? Her smile was bright and friendly, which Hunter, given her evening, found selfishly annoying. She wasn't in the mood for chit-chat. Not with anyone, especially not Sam. Fine. Oh, well, good, I guess. Mine was fun. My gang at the senior center was so sweet tonight, Hunter. Mr. Earnhardt started working on a scrapbook page for his honeymoon. You should have seen how he lit up when he talked about his wife. Sounds awesome. It was all Hunter could give, because the obstacle to her evening was sitting on the couch, looking rather beautiful and unaffected. And whether any of that was Samantha's fault or not, Hunter was beyond frustrated. And done with it. Sam sat forward. Want some ice cream? I bought coffee flavored at the deli on the way home. I remembered it's one we both liked. Oh, how wonderful. She'd been extra thoughtful, too. Hunter's anger only escalated. This girl was too much. Nope, I'm not hungry. Another night, then. Hunter made a beeline for her bedroom, but Samantha was still talking. You know what else was funny tonight? You have to hear this. Apparently, some of the guys at the center came up with a nickname for, Can you stop? Hunter whirled around, making no attempt to mask her anger. I'm not in the mood. I don't want to hear about your good-hearted volunteer job right now. I just can't. Sam shifted. Whoa, what's with the attitude? I don't have an attitude, she said louder than was probably warranted. I just can't listen to you do the adorable thing tonight, okay? The adorable thing causes problems. And while we're at it, no more of the sexy thing either. That means sexy glasses are off the table. Hunter slammed her door before opening it one last time. And I'll unload the dishwasher from now on, got it? Because it's not fair. Samantha stared at her, wide-eyed, and held up her palms. Be my guest, crazy town. Just remember when you're unloading that the big knives go. I know where the damn big knives go. God, I'm tired of the big knives. And with that, she slammed the door again, leaving Samantha wondering what the hell had just happened. Moments later, the door flew open again, and Hunter stalked to the bathroom. And if it's okay with you, I'm going to take a shower. At night. Which is totally off schedule. Outrageous, right? I hope you'll find a way to live. Bang went the bathroom door. Sam jumped as it echoed through the loft. Okay. So, Hunter Angry was a new experience for Samantha? In fact, She'd never known a more laid-back, easygoing person in her life. But something had Hunter's ire up in a big way, and she hadn't a clue what it was. What she was aware of, however, was how unexpectedly hot it was. Angry Hunter was a whole new kind of intriguing that she felt the effects of, well, all over. She heard the water flash on, and once again, pushed herself not to imagine Hunter in the shower, standing under its stream, the water rolling down her skin. Hot, wet, and soapy. God, 
There was a time not so long ago when showers were merely a method to get clean. Could she go back to that, please? Trade in the lust-induced visions, which were now even more blatant following the amazing kitchen kissing. It was as if the night before had unleashed a whole new kind of longing. Damn rebound mode. She couldn't wait for it to pass. Raising her hands in the air and dropping them helplessly, she decided to escape the situation to her room and busy herself with getting ready for bed. But her skin was extra sensitive as she slipped into a t-shirt, the weight of it noticeable as she slid beneath the cool covers. It wasn't long before she heard the shower switch off. She knew from experience that in a few moments, Hunter would travel from the bathroom to her bedroom wrapped in a towel. She also knew that if she timed her totally necessary trip to the kitchen for a glass of water just right, she'd steal a glimpse. She threw the covers off and walked confidently to the kitchen. Because water had restorative powers, and she should be drinking more of it. Everyone knew that. Everyone. Chapter 8 the office clock read 5.53 when Samantha checked it Wednesday evening. Somehow between her call with Serenity to finalize a payment schedule and her creation of a new Excel spreadsheet for their account, Brooklyn had left for the day. This meant she was probably headed home to change into comfortable clothes for throwback movie Wednesday, and Samantha needed to step it up if she wanted to be ready in time. They'd selected Boeing Boeing with Tony Curtis, which had Sam excited because she'd never seen it. After tying up some final loose ends at Savvy, she headed upstairs and went about prepping for the film. Comfy clothes, check. Diet soda, poured. Popcorn, popped. Wine open and breathing for post-popcorn consumption. She queued up the DVD and checked the clock on the microwave. Only a couple of minutes after seven, so technically Brooklyn wasn't late yet. When you took into consideration that Brooklyn operated on an entirely different time system. Hunter's bedroom door was closed. She'd beat Samantha out of the office, but Sam could hear the faint sound of a guitar, which meant Hunter was definitely in there and probably lost in her own world. Earlier that morning, she'd stopped by Sam's desk and quietly apologized for her outburst the evening prior, citing a bad night. Sam accepted, and they'd moved into awkward, overly polite territory, which fell away by lunchtime when Hunter stole three french fries off her plate as she passed. Prompting Samantha to throw a wadded-up piece of paper at her retreating form, earning them each an admonishing look from Mallory, who was on the phone with a potential client. At 7.36, Samantha's allowance for Brooklyn time was slipping. She checked her phone and stole a bite of popcorn in the process. No messages. She fired off a text. On your way? Time ticked by, but no response came in. Hey, Hunter said an hour later as she passed by the couch. Sam lay on her back, staring up at the industrial rafters across the ceiling. What happened to the movie? You ask an excellent question. Hunter paused, peering down at her. Oh no, Brooklyn canceled? No, that would have required some sort of communication. That would have been the thoughtful thing to do, Sam answered resolutely. We made plans for throwback movie Wednesday over the weekend. She was the one who brought it up, and now she's flaked out on me. I can only assume that's what happened, however. Either that, or she's been put in jail for reckless driving. That second part is a definite possibility. Hunter perched on the arm of the couch. I'm sorry, Sam. Want me to watch it with you? Negative. Hunter didn't know exactly what to do here. She was pretty sure Brooklyn hadn't meant to stand Sam up. But at the same time, she was angry at Brooklyn for allowing this to happen especially after she'd just vowed to fix her friendship with Sam, 
who now looked like a dejected little puppy. She had an idea. You know we're gonna need our own traditions, don't you? Sam shifted her gaze to Hunter, a modicum of interest taking shape on her face. What do you mean? Well, you and Brooklyn had your whatever day of the week movie nights, that I can never keep straight, and your Lucy the Troublemaker marathons. We probably need to step up our roommate relationship if we have any chance of competing. A small smile tugged at the corner of Samantha's mouth. Jackpot. Yeah? What about dishwasher Fridays? You think you're funny. The green eyes danced and Hunter shook her head. How do you feel about jigsaw puzzles? Sam seemed to think on this. I did those little square ones as a kid. No, amateur. I mean the real ones, the 5,000-piece monsters that take over the kitchen table for a week or two. Sam sat up. Do you have one of these puzzles to contribute to the cause? More than one. And three of them I've yet to work. And you want us to do one? Sam looked hopeful. I think it could be fun. Want me to get it? Well, that depends. Can we drink wine while we work it? Oh, I think we have to drink wine while we work it. I mean, if you want to do it right. And I do. Samantha scurried up from the couch and went about clearing off the kitchen table. Hunter warmed at Sam's sudden excitement and retrieved a box from the top of her closet. I've been holding on to this one for a special occasion, and I'm feeling like this is kind of the night for it. Because I'm in rebound mode, and now my friend has neglected me too, and you feel bad? And now we have to hit pause. Why are we pausing? Because there's something you need to recognize. This is not a pity move, Ennis. I've never worked a puzzle with anyone. I'm pretty proprietary about my puzzles. And I'm only agreeing to work this one with you because I want to. Is that understood? A smile grew on Sam's face, and her voice was quiet when she answered. Understood. Great. She turned the box around. We'll be working on Rue Paris by the artist D. Davidson. Samantha took the box from Hunter and studied the image on the front. It's so beautiful. God, I want to go to Paris. Hunter peered over her shoulder. It was a favorite piece of hers, and one of the reasons she'd held the puzzle back for a special occasion. The artwork depicted a Parisian street just after a rain shower. There was a bicyclist on his way somewhere, two old-fashioned cars parked on the curb, and an expanse of gorgeous French buildings complete with window box flowers of all different colors. At the end of the street, the Eiffel Tower could be seen peeking out from behind a building. But probably Hunter's favorite part was the two-story street lanterns that brought the whole scene together. It was a breathtaking painting. All right, she said to Sam. There'll be time for us to get more acquainted with the image as we go. First, let's get some basics out of the way. Hunter went on to explain to Sam the best strategy for effective puzzle assembly, creating the outline of the puzzle first, color sorting, and section assembly, all the things that would see them through. So, let's find our corner pieces and get started. Hunter put on some Beatles music, and the two went to work in companionable silence, grooving to the music here and there. As she worked, Hunter stole occasional glances at Sam, who had a tendency to chew the inside of her cheek when she concentrated making it hard for Hunter to turn away. But somehow she did. She also worked extra hard at ignoring the way Sam's slim-fitting green t-shirt hugged her curves and dipped a tad in the front. That part was hard, because the skin there was smooth and probably soft. But she refocused because the mission in front of them was an important one, 
and worthy of her attention. It wasn't long before Hunter's experience showed, and her section took noticeable shape over Sam's. As the music transitioned to Eleanor Rigby, Samantha surveyed the workspace and straightened with a sigh. This isn't at all fair. You're a visual person. It's what you do for a living. I'm cerebral. We need cerebral on jigsaw puzzles. Trust me. And we're not in competition, champ. We're on the same team. Sam brightened. It was cute. Really cute. You're right. I forgot that part. More wine? Hunter glanced at her mostly full glass. I'm good. The outline of the puzzle was close to assembled, and they'd been at it for just over an hour. Sam came around the island with a refreshed glass of Pinot Grigio and studied their progress. So, once our frame is in place, what's next? How about you start work on the cafe tables at the bottom left, and I'll start assembling the top of the apartment building at the top right. I think that's an excellent decision. Well, your faith in me speaks volumes. Hunter's phone buzzed from its spot on the counter. She ignored it, focusing on gathering pieces of the brown building and green shutters. Samantha glanced down at it. Someone named Misty from the club wants to know what you're up to. Hunter continued to sort pieces. She does? Shall I tell her you're assembling Paris and to try back later? Or do you want to take a few minutes and talk to her? I find that if I'm busy, it's best to just not answer. Samantha tilted her head as she came back around to her side of the puzzle. She seemed thoughtful as she began to sort pieces of her own. So you name them after what? Where you met them? It was embarrassing, Sam seeing that text and the label that it came in with. She straightened, feeling the need to explain. It was something I started doing when I was younger. I exchanged numbers with more girls than I should have. Because you never want to hurt anyone's feelings. I've met you. You've always been that way, and then you wind up with more women following you around than you know what to do with. You should be more upfront if you're not interested. Hunter shrugged. I just don't like upsetting anyone. But then the girls who asked for my number would inevitably call, and I'd have no clue who they were. Hence, labeling the number in advance. Hence, indeed. Sam passed her a look. Your feelings matter, too, you know? Yeah, well, I'm a work in progress, what can I say? Pass me that piece with a sliver of green on the side. Sam handed her the puzzle piece. I'm terrified of what the readout says when I call you. Hunter laughed. My lips are sealed. Favorite roommate? Sam asked. Again, I simply can't say. I could just call it right now, you know. Hunter grinned. But that would ruin the fun. They went back to work. Hunter enjoyed working alongside Samantha, watching her get frustrated when she couldn't find the piece she needed, and then celebrate when she finally did. And Sam was a toucher, always had been. It spoke to her warmth. Every so often, she'd place a hand on Hunter's back as they talked or she'd trail her fingers briefly across Hunter's forearm when she made a point. She probably didn't notice it herself, but it was thrilling. Hunter studied Sam as she concentrated. She'd pulled her hair back halfway through the night to keep it from getting in the way of her work, leaving her slender neck visible. It looked edible. Why do you think my chair doesn't resemble the painting on the cover of the box? Hunter glanced at her work. Hmm, because the leg is wrong. You've jammed the leg from one of the other tables onto this one. Jeez, you were determined to make that work, weren't you? Sam laughed helplessly. I figured it was close enough. Hunter stared at her. Shock, horror. 
What if Pinkberry put the toppings on someone else's yogurt because it was close enough to yours? Now you're just being dramatic. Look at you. You have dramatic face. Totally true, so she milked it even more. Poor little puzzle piece. Didn't deserve to be manhandled. Sam pointed at her. You're a mean person, preying upon my well-known tendency to assign feelings to inanimate objects. I think you broke its little heart, Hunter said, staring sadly at the puzzle piece. But they were both laughing now, and Sam playfully nudged Hunter's shoulder with her own. This is fun, you torturing me, me learning how to properly work a puzzle. Sam turned more fully to Hunter as her laughter melted into a sincere smile. You're fun. This, I have to admit, was a genius idea. I think so, too. Can you imagine if I'd just advertised blindly for a new roommate? There'd be no sought-after lesbian or her staring obsessed dog living in my loft with me. And I'd never have gotten to work this really awesome puzzle. And I'd still be thinking of unloading the dishwasher as just a mundane activity. Or that, Sam said, finding Hunter's eyes. Because of puzzle-assembling necessity, they were standing rather close to each other. Extra close, Hunter noted. And Samantha's gaze had dropped to her mouth, where it now lingered. God, Hunter wanted to reach out and touch her cheek pull her in. She felt that tug all over, to act, to take what she craved. The moment had shifted from playful, and now the air around them felt quite heavy. Electric, even. How are we right back here? Samantha asked quietly. But she hadn't exactly moved away. If anything, she felt closer. I don't know, Hunter murmured. There's this thing that, that what? That makes me want to be near you, to touch you, to kiss you, like I did the other night. Bottom line, I think I'm really attracted to you. She wasn't sure why she was showing her cards. Maybe because she'd tried the aversion tactics and they hadn't worked. However, there was one thing she knew for certain. Ever since she'd confessed her long-ago feelings for Sam, it was as if she'd unlatched some sort of Pandora's box of thoughts and events that she could no more undo than she could step away from Sam right now. But the one thing that had her on hyper alert, that snagged her attention above all else, was that Samantha was looking at her with the exact same longing. Me too, Sam said just barely above a whisper. And I don't even know when that happened. I think maybe I'm in rebound mode. Hunter assessed the situation, never taking her eyes off Sam. So, two people who are attracted to each other. A lot. It's probably something we should deal with, Samantha said. There are a lot of ways to do that. Some more tempting than others. Mm-hmm. Hunter touched the very cheek she thought of touching just moments before. Samantha's skin was soft, warm, and those green eyes with the gold flecks held steady to hers. What was so wrong with two consenting adults consenting? Her heart was beating out of her chest as she remembered the way Sam's mouth had felt, slanted over hers, all hungry and amazing. For the first time, she wasn't sure what move to make. She didn't have to decide. Samantha, in an unexpected turn, went up on her toes and slowly slid her hands against Hunter's cheeks, and then into her hair as she brought her lips to just within millimeters of Hunter's. But then she paused there, face to face, in a delay that was so purposeful, it was intoxicating. What are you up to right now? Hunter asked. No good, Sam answered. There was no denying who was in control of this exchange. Finally, 
Sam inclined her head and pressed her lips to Hunter's in a move that had Hunter dizzy and breathless and wanting so much more. The door to the loft slid open behind them, and without hesitation, Sam pulled her lips from Hunter and transitioned the kiss into a hug with lightning-fast agility, just in time for Brooklyn to fly into the space. You are amazing, Sam said loudly as she squeezed Hunter to her. Clearly in play it off, we're just two friends minding our own business mode. Who knew you were so good at puzzles? Hunter plastered a smile on her face, but no cognizant thought seemed to come. They turned to Brooklyn, Samantha looking about as casual as casual could be, and Hunter struggling desperately to keep up. Try to be a person, she told herself. Try to be a person. Sammy, Brooklyn said, her eyes wide with regret. I am so sorry. Exponentially, you have no idea. It's fine, Sam answered quickly but there was a distance in her voice as she went back to assembling her outdoor cafe. We were just working a puzzle. It's not fine, Brooklyn said, tears now brimming. I'm this horrible friend who thought today was Tuesday, and when I saw your text and remembered it wasn't, I just grabbed my bag and raced back. But it's too late. The night's ruined. She dropped onto the couch, and the tears fell uninhibited. Samantha didn't know what to do here. She looked to Hunter, who shrugged worriedly back at her. True, Sam's feelings had been hurt at being stood up, but Brooklyn wasn't a crier. And the fact that she now sat on the couch in shambles was a red flag if Samantha had ever seen one. Pushing her own feelings aside, she moved to the couch and sat putting her arm around her friend. Brooks, really, it's okay. You forgot. It happens. Hunter sat in the chair next to the couch and placed a hand on Brooklyn's knee. Is something else going on? Brooklyn wiped the tears from her eyes, but more just fell in their place. I'm just screwing everything up. I've been a horrible friend to you. I can't seem to think of Jessica's place as ours. I don't know my way around the village well enough, and the foster account was my baby. That loss is on me, no one else. She took a shuddering breath, seeking a composure that didn't come. I'm screwing everything up. Sam opened her mouth to speak, to tell Brooklyn not to worry, but Hunter beat her to the punch. Are you ready to hear the truth? Brooklyn blinked back at her, sobering. Yeah. Your world feels upside down right now, and you feel a little out of control. Am I close? Uh-huh. Brooklyn had the adorable child thing down pat. And that makes perfect sense, because you took a big leap moving in with Jess. Does she make you happy? The smile was on Brooklyn's face instantaneously. You have no idea. Then, it's time for you to make the village your bitch. Learn its nooks and crannies. Find a favorite coffee spot. Pinpoint the best brunch to sit and stare. Because you love to brainstorm. This seemed to pump Brooklyn up in a way Samantha wouldn't have predicted. I can do that. But Hunter wasn't done. Foster made poor business decisions. They're a multi-million dollar company, and that Royce guy with the plastic hair could have bet it all away at the racetrack, for all we know. You do not single-handedly take down Foster Foods. You're not that powerful, are you? No. I mean, it would be awesome if I were, but I'm not. Brooklyn seemed to sit a little taller. So... The loss of the account was out of your hands. We wowed them every step of the way. You wowed them. And if they bounce back, you'll wow them again. If not, you'll work your magic on the accounts Mal is going to land to replace them. Brooklyn nodded five or six times, taking it all in. Her resolve seemed much stronger, and Sam passed Hunter an appreciative smile. I'm really sorry about tonight, Sam. I really miss you, and was looking forward to it. 
I've just been so stressed that I got my days jumbled. Don't fucking let it happen again, Samantha said harshly. Brooklyn's eyes went wide, and Sam smiled. Kidding, was just trying the hunter approach, but I'll stick with what I'm good at. Now, hug me like you love me, cause you do. Brooklyn threw her arms around Sam. I do love you, more than the moon and covered bridges and root beer and fast cars. That's a lot, Samantha said, squeezing her back. And maybe we can do throwback movie Wednesday on Makeup Thursday? Sam lit up. I like Makeup Thursday. It's new. Hunter looked on. Perfect. Friend Fest was clearly in full effect. You guys are quirky and weird again. Excellent. Wine, Brooks? Brooklyn stood. Better not. I need to get into the office early tomorrow. I'll let you two get back to whatever it is you were doing. At that, Samantha's gaze brushed Hunter's, and a surge of heat raced through her at the memory of where they'd left off. With a quick final hug to both, a decidedly much happier Brooklyn headed home for the night. As the loft door thudded closed, silence reigned. Not really sure what to do with herself, Samantha took to straightening up the place. It's getting late, she said. It was really just something to say. She wasn't tired, and in fact would probably read for another hour or so before bed. Bridget Jones's diary was on tap. She loved an underdog, and luckily the mood from earlier had been broken. The courage she'd found to initiate that kiss had been crazily out of character for her. She'd been reckless and blamed the wine. She should stick to a zero to one glass limit on weeknights from here forward. Zero was probably in her best interest these days. I'll help. Hunter grabbed her own glass and the bowl of popcorn from the coffee table. They met at the kitchen sink, reaching across each other to deposit the dishes. Their shoulders touched. And that was really all it took for Samantha. She stole a sideways glance at Hunter, who really was just so beautiful. Hey, Hunter said. Hey, yourself. Pass me that glass? Hunter did as she was asked. So. Well, don't hog all the words. Hunter grinned into the sink. I guess I don't know exactly what to say, which is odd. I guess that makes two of us. The first time they'd kissed, she'd been so caught off guard that she'd felt her way through it blindly only relishing the exchange in the moments after, the replay. This second time, she'd known enough to appreciate what was happening. But it had been so damn short-lived, with Brooklyn's interruption. And now what? Now, you ignore that tingly feeling in the pit of your stomach, and the obvious urges elsewhere. You also ignore your preoccupation with Hunter's awesomely full lips, and you go to bed. Put some distance between the two of you. Now. I'm exhausted. Yeah, me too. Hunter leaned against the counter. We should probably get some sleep. Right, Sam gestured to the puzzle. But we're going to finish this, right? We have to. Hunter smiled at her. Of course, it's a puzzle rule. Once you start, you have to finish. All right, roommate, I'm holding you to it. Because tonight, well, it was much needed. It made me want to have more nights like this one. Hunter held her gaze and Sam felt the sincerity pass between them. Me too. She needed to walk away now. It was important that she walk away. Well, good night. Night, Sam. When she was safely tucked away in her room, she blew out a breath. Crisis averted, at least temporarily. But she'd stirred the pot. 
She'd initiated the kiss that had her knees going weak. And thank God Brooklyn had interrupted. Where would it have led otherwise? Her lips on Hunter's, their bodies pressed together. Her hands wandering underneath Hunter's shirt, exploring the breasts that... God, she was doing it all over again. Samantha looked at her reflection in the mirror. You, she said to herself, are an idiot. God, why did life have to be so complicated? But it had been a good move, sidestepping whatever was bubbling between her and Hunter, even though she was super tempted to just give herself over to it. Live a little. She needed to think it through from a few different directions and then come up with a plan that would help them push past this little blip in their relationship so life could be normal again. Because the tension that seemed to have taken up residence between them was not of the friend variety. She had a couple of options. Run with the newfound chemistry, or fight it. And choice two simply had to be the way to go, because Hunter was one person she simply could not get involved with. Excellent decision. Go her. But her victory celebration was cut short by the knock on her door. She dropped her head in defeat and pep-talked herself for the short distance it took to open it. But as soon as she did, all bets were off. Hunter stood there, her gaze purposeful, her lips parted slightly, and Sam knew she was in trouble. Hunter, who was usually cool and calm, was seemingly on a mission, and it was sexy as hell. Sam was pretty sure Hunter had a few complicated ideas of her own. Without a word spoken, they moved to each other and met in a kiss that couldn't be described as sweet or tender or slow. No, this was primal and fast and unbridled a clash of lips and tongues, and it was way past good. Hunter kissed her with abandon, hard, thorough, aggressive, and she gave back just as much, surprising even herself. But kissing this woman was like a newly discovered drug. Sam felt alive in a way she hadn't in so long. Sam backed them farther into the room, her need shooting up exponentially with each step she took. Hunter's hands were on her now, and that was excellent, because she craved that. First they moved to Sam's waist, then her ribcage. They covered her breasts, and Sam moaned into the kiss as a sharp bolt of heat shot quickly from her center downward. She pushed her tongue into Hunter's mouth and explored, the taste of her making Sam forget all the reasons this was a bad idea. Had this off-the-chart sizzle been between them this whole time? As they sat together in the savvy offices all these years, they'd been capable of this? Amazing. Clothes were coming off, she realized absently. She was undressing Hunter, breaking the kiss only to navigate pulling the shirt over Hunter's head. And there standing in front of her in just a black bra and panties, was the Victoria's secret body that should have come with a warning label, because the slender lines that melted to sexy curves were doing a number on Sam's ability to think clearly. But there was no time for that, anyway. Samantha wanted to feel that body against hers. She found Hunter's mouth again and steered them toward the bed on a mission. She would deal with the ramifications later. They landed on the soft duvet, which evened out their height difference nicely. Hunter was on top and moving against her subtly, kissing Samantha's neck with skilled precision. Their pace was fast and purposeful. As intoxicating as this whole experience was, Sam knew she wasn't going to last much longer as she met each movement of Hunter's hips, straining already for sweet release. She was on fire, the aching between her legs insistent. As if reading her mind, Hunter made quick work of the t-shirt Sam wore and undid the clasp of her bra with one hand. Impressive, 
the real-life version of herself thought. But the sex vixen in her didn't dwell, and pushed her hands into Hunter's hair. Thick and glorious. Hunter's head dipped to Samantha's breast and caught a nipple, swirling her tongue against it, taking it fully in her mouth. Samantha almost came undone then and there, pushing harder against Hunter's knee, the throbbing now too much to withstand. Without shifting attention from her breasts, Hunter reached into Sam's pants and stroked her softly on the outside of her underwear. More, Sam breathed. She was dying, simply dying. Taking matters into her own hands, she grabbed the sides of Hunter's panties and pushed them down as much as her position would allow her. She needed to feel Hunter against her before this was over. Fully. Understanding her intention, Hunter kicked off the underwear, tossed her bra onto the floor, and then removed the last of Sam's clothing in rapid succession. She settled back on top of Samantha. As she pressed against her, skin on skin, Sam's mind went white. Reaching a hand between them, Hunter slipped inside her, and with her thumb, offered Samantha attention where she needed it most. With purposeful movement of her hips, cradled between Sam's open thighs, Hunter pushed against her hand slowly, driving Sam utterly wild. She turned her head against the pillow as the pressure built inside her steadily until she was sure it couldn't possibly climb any higher. And then, she did. Thrust upon thrust sent her to new and unexplored heights she couldn't quite perceive. Finally, in a burst of pleasure, she came hard and fast, uncontrollably flying. She clutched Hunter and rode out the blissful waves that took her over completely. The expanse of pleasure that crashed into her was shocking. Hunter generally took her time with sex. She liked the unravel, but something about her desire for Samantha had superseded that preference, and she couldn't have slowed her pace if she'd tried. Watching Sam during the last moments of release had Hunter more turned on than she'd probably been in her entire life. And what was even more shocking was that without having been touched much herself yet, she was only moments behind Samantha. She looked down at Sam whose lips were still parted, whose breathing was still heavy, whose hips still moved against Hunter's in a rhythmic dance. Samantha was still coming down herself, but she met Hunter's eyes and seemed to know. She reached between their bodies then, and with only a couple of firm strokes, sent Hunter tumbling over the edge after her. Sam clung to her tightly, rocking her through it. God. The sensations tore through her hard and fast, like no other time she could remember. She felt that pleasure well into her fingertips, her toes, all over. She eased onto the bed next to Samantha, and stared up at the ceiling, attempting to breathe, as Sam brought her back down from the last remaining sensations gently, with her hand, placing small kisses on the underside of her jaw. A moment passed, and Hunter's sensibilities drifted back to her. Sam turned her head on the pillow and faced her. We're going to hell. You know this. Hunter laughed quietly, still on a euphoric high. We are not. We're adults. We're allowed to do that if we want. Adults who are going to hell. She covered her eyes with both hands. Hunter's gaze traveled the expanse of Samantha's body, on display for her now, and everything she imagined it would be. And, okay, more. She really couldn't get enough of Sam's breasts. She stared at them now, tracing a nipple with her index finger, causing Sam to inhale sharply. You're good at this, you know that? Sam said, her eyes still closed. At. This specifically. She traced the underside of the curve and leaned down, pulling a nipple into her mouth. Sam sucked in a breath. At sex, 
God, okay, specifically this, too. You have to stop now. Hunter propped her head up on her elbow and looked down at Samantha, grinning. If that's what you want. Sam covered her eyes with both hands. I don't know what I want. I can't believe I just had sex with you. That wasn't supposed to happen. As in ever. Hunter sobered, understanding the importance of the line they'd crossed, but trying to help Sam through it. I know. But there are worse things. Floods, hurricanes, Republicans. Plus, you have to admit, this was really good. I'm still feeling it. Sam stole a peek at her. It was, wasn't it? Wasn't just me? Hunter shook her head slowly. No way. Hot or not, I think we broke some kind of cosmic friend rule. That part's possible. But sex is a part of life. We just have to handle ourselves as such. So we're physically into each other. There don't have to be strings, ramifications. Sam pushed herself up onto her elbow. Are you proposing a friends with benefits arrangement? Was she? Maybe, given our recent struggles. That's not such a horrible idea. Samantha stared at the ceiling, and Hunter wondered if she'd just said the completely wrong thing. Well, I am in rebound mode. You are, and I'm not going to complicate your life. You can rebound with me all you want. Plus, we genuinely like each other. Samantha stared off. Could be a win-win. You see who you want to see. I'll see who I want to see, and if this happens again, not a big deal. No drama. Slipping under the sheet, Samantha blew out a breath. Okay, no drama. I can do that. And we're not the first two people on the planet who've slept together. Samantha laughed. No? Nope. Hunter sat up. But I get why you're freaking out. Big knives are in the towel drawer. Sam passed her a look. Decode, please. I'm naked in your bed right now, which is not one of my roles in your life. Thereby, I'm not in my proper place. Like the big knives. It's okay. It's just how you work. I'm learning this more and more. I guess there's truth in that. Hunter kissed Sam's cheek and lingered a second, enjoying the scent of Sam's sweet-smelling shampoo. I'll head back to my drawer now. The world will keep turning, I promise. Sweet dreams. She gathered her various clothing items, and without putting them on, walked slowly back to her room, feeling Samantha's eyes on her the entire time. If she'd peeked into Pandora's box with that college confession some weeks back, then she'd just blown the whole damn lid off the thing with that little escapade. But maybe this arrangement with Sam was just what she needed to kick her back into business-as-usual mode. The itch wasn't going away, and now she'd scratched it. Problem solved. As she climbed into her own bed, a chill moved through her, much the way it had shortly before the midnight chocolate that brought her to the loft in the first place. She pulled the covers tighter around her body and sighed against her pillow. Something important was working its way to her. Chapter 9 Hunter checked her watch. Late. She stood on the white steps in front of the NCO club on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. It was a quarter to eight, and her father's birthday party had started at six. Her flight had been delayed an hour, and the gate guard was newly on duty and had trouble locating the guest list for the party. Without a military ID, she'd been sent to the visitor's center to fill out the necessary paperwork. So much for making a good impression. 
She made her way into the lobby of the club and could tell from the direction of the music that they'd selected the Dedalian room for the party. She looked around at the brown tile, the black and white photos on the wall of some of the famous squadrons from years gone by, the shadow boxes that commemorated so many of the pilots who'd come before her father. He'd once been a member of the Air Mobility Command Unit, but Hunter couldn't tell you much about what that was. He never really talked about it with her. God, it was surreal to be back on base, though. The same club in which her family'd had breakfast once a month for most of her life. Her mother's idea. Her father, meanwhile, had spent much of his spare time in the bar straight ahead of her. He wasn't an alcoholic. In fact, he never had more than a couple drinks at one time. No, it was more about dodging as much time with his kids as he possibly could. Sometimes she wondered why he'd even agreed to have them. There you are. Hunter turned and smiled at her older sister, Claire, who was picturesque in a white dress. Her dark hair was touched with blonde highlights and swept into an overly fancy twist. And just like that, Hunter felt underdressed in her black pants and sleeveless dark green sheath. Hi, Claire. Sorry I'm late. The flight. Mama's been worried sick. She thought you'd changed your mind. Give me a hug, and then come and say hello to everyone. Claire paused. Oh, you wore pants. Well, you look nice anyway. It won't matter. Thanks, I think. The hug was quick, but it was enough for a potent hit from her sister's Chanel perfume a trademark. Claire had fully assumed her position as debutante Barbie. That much was true. Hunter followed her sister into the ballroom, scanning the faces from the perimeter. Where's Kevin? She asked, excited to see her little brother. The kid used to follow her around incessantly, her consummate shadow. The larger age gap made her extra protective of him. While Hunter was only three years younger than Claire, her brother was twelve years her junior and had been a bit of a surprise to her parents. But as a result, they'd avoided the typical sibling bickering, and instead, Kevin had developed sort of a hero worship for Hunter. But she adored him right back. He was kind and funny, and come on, just adorable. He'd turned sixteen this year, and a shot of guilt hit as she remembered she'd not been there to celebrate the occasion. She really needed to be around more for him. You're here! Hunter turned at the exuberant sound of her mother's voice and folded herself into the open arms she saw waiting for her just a few feet away. Her mother was quite a bit shorter than she was, but won the award for the best hugs on the planet. She savored the safety she felt when enveloped in one. Hi, Mama. I promised you I'd be here, didn't I? You did, and you're here. How was the flight? Did they serve a meal? It was fine, and no, they don't really do that anymore. Her mother shook her head. That's horrible. Someone should write a letter. She released Hunter from the hug, but still had a firm hold on her arm. That was the thing about her mom. Once she got Hunter home, it was like she couldn't stop touching her to make sure she was really there. Hunter complained about it as a formality, but deep down it made her happy. Let's go say hello to your father. I think the crowds make him uncomfortable. Yeah, well, what didn't? Her mother led the way through the throngs of party guests, stopping to point out Hunter's arrival to all they passed. Friends and neighbors of her parents gushed about how grown up she now was and exaggerated about how pretty she'd turned out. She smiled and hugged and said the appropriate thank yous, all the while dreading the moment that was fast approaching. To distract herself, she took in the colorful decorations, birthday-themed mostly, but with the ever-present Hawaiian luau accents on the side. 
Clearly her mother and Claire had raided some contrasting aisles at Party City. Pretty typical of any Blair gathering. As they approached her father at the front of the room, he was talking to a man Hunter vaguely recognized as a former serviceman, one of his cronies from the good old days. He'd aged, her father. That was the thing that jumped out at her most. The hair that on her visit just last year had been salt and pepper was now entirely white. The lines impressed upon his face had deepened as well. It was a startling realization when your parents aged. Her father turned in their direction, and after only a minor pause, went back to his conversation. Nice. Inside, she laughed wryly. How very Richard Blair of him. Rich, say hello to Hunter. She flew in for your birthday. For her mother's benefit, she played the part. Happy birthday, Dad. Thank you, Hunter. You look well. I'm glad you made the trip. Also for her mother's part. The crony, whoever he was, grinned warmly in her direction. I remember when you came up to here, he said, indicating a spot close to his hip. The man opened his arms and pulled Hunter into a full-on embrace. It's so good to see you, sweetheart. She accepted the warm hug, noting the irony. This stranger was overjoyed to see her, while her own father could barely be bothered to glance in her direction. He stood there, clearly uncomfortable and unsure what to do about it, as the man released her. Hell, it was his birthday. Why not throw the old guy a bone and let him off the hook? I'm going to go find Kevin, she told the men slipping away effectively with her mother at her side. Once they were a safe distance away, her mother squeezed her arm. You did good, Hunter. It was the right thing to do to come to the party, and he will remember this, that you were here. Look, Mama, I came for you, because I love you, and it's what you wanted. You've been both mother and father to me for a while now. Let's be real about that. The smile that had been on her mother's lips just moments before had dimmed noticeably, and Hunter was sorry to have been the cause. I don't want to concentrate on any of that. I'm here now, and I want to spend time with you and Claire and Kevin. Her mother nodded, and it seemed like something else was on her mind. About your brother. What about him? He's had a rough time lately. I was hoping your visit might help to cheer him up. Cheer who up? Claire asked. Mama, the McElroys are leaving and want to say goodbye. On my way, her mother said. Will you find Kevin so Hunter can say hello? She asked Claire. At the mention of her brother's name, Claire sighed audibly. He's out back. He pulled off his tie and tossed it in the dumpster seemed a little extreme. How do I get there? Hunter asked. Claire pointed at an unmarked door at the back of the room. Maybe you'll have some luck. I'm done trying for tonight. Have you seen Chip? I want to slow dance. Hunter pointed across the room at her rather preppy brother-in-law. There's that handsome guy. Remind me to tell you later some tricks I learned. Hunter blinked at her sister. Tricks? In the bedroom, silly. Good stuff, too. We use props now. It's revived us in a big way. Hunter was instantly uncomfortable at the thought of her sister and Chip going at it, but did her best to push aside the upsetting visuals in favor of sisterly support. Can't wait, she said, forcing a smile. Claire winked and took off in search of said husband as Hunter tried to erase that conversation from her brain forever and always. Claire had always been a bit of an oversharer. Hunter followed Claire's directions to the back of the club. She couldn't wait to see the little rug rat, knock him in the head and work their secret handshake. Smiling, she pushed through the door to the outside 
and found herself on the loading dock where three boys stood together in conglomeration. Dark hair, dark clothes, and yep, that was eyeliner. Goth kids. Perfect. Hey guys, have you seen Kevin? The three regarded her with what could best be described as bored tolerance. What? The one in the middle asked, totally uninterested in the question. He had his hair spiked, his eyebrow pierced, and dark makeup that made him look a little bit like the undead. But that was her brother, all right. Good God. What had happened to that happy-go-lucky smiler she'd seen just under a year ago? Hey, Kevin, she said, smiling. You're not even going to hug me? It's been forever. My sister, he said with mild annoyance to his friends. Text me. The other two scary kids mumbled some sort of assent and took off into the night. Kevin turned to face her before his eyes settled on the ground. Hey. He was much taller now, and his voice was an entire octave lower. It was more than a little shocking. He made no move to hug her, so she completed the distance herself and wrapped her arms around him in what had to be the most awkward hug in history. He was easily her height, and probably not done growing. I can't believe how much older you look. Usually this would be the point where Kevin would grin in triumph as he was always trying to impress her. Except for now, when he couldn't care less. Yeah, well, time is real. Time is real? Interesting. He was fixated on the door behind her, and she understood that he was counting the seconds until she'd leave him alone. Hunter remembered what Claire had said. She'd given up on him. She remembered her mother's imploring look to talk to Kevin. Clearly there had been some changes in her brother over the course of the last year, and they weren't all physical. Some were to be expected. Teenagers acted out. Hell, she did. But this was something else entirely. The kid looked like he hated the world. She wasn't about to give up, though. So, when did you start wearing eyeliner? When did you? Fair enough question, despite the fact that his face gave off a lot of scorn. Fifteen or so, I guess. I didn't mean that as a judgment. Just curious. Cool. He looked away. How's school going? Fine. You still playing soccer? She was grappling here. One-word answers seemed to be Kevin's new thing. Nope. Okay, no soccer? Now that really was a red flag. Soccer was Kevin's entire life. He played it incessantly, had posters on his wall of his favorite players. It was rare you saw the kid without a soccer ball under his arm. What do you mean you're not playing soccer? Why did you quit? He shook his head in disgust, which just upset her further. Okay, what's with the look? I'm struggling to understand what's going on with you, kid, but you're not giving me much. Doesn't matter. He walked past her for the door. Well, it does to me. He shrugged. That's gotta suck. It was the last thing he said to her as he closed the door, and he disappeared into the club. Hunter was thrown. She didn't know who that chip-on-his-shoulder-hate-the-world teenager was, but it certainly wasn't the younger brother she knew and loved. She shook her head and stared out at the Ohio night sky. She should have been here more. Screw her father and the way he made her feel. Why did she let that dictate the relationship she had with the rest of her family? Her brother was a mess. Her sister had washed her hands of it, and her mother, bless her, was doing everything in her power to hold them all together. And what had she done? Ignored them for the past year? Only visited a handful of times since college? Hunter knew, with painstaking clarity, 
how selfish she had been, and she hated herself for it. With renewed determination, she found her sister inside the club. How long has he been like this? Claire looked suddenly tired and uncomfortable. She'd never done well with conflict, and preferred to think the world was a happy, shiny place for all to live. The black clothes hit about six months ago, and the attitude was shortly behind them. Do you think it's just a passing fixation, or is it worse? Is he into drugs? Claire shrugged. It's not like he'd tell me. I offered to take him for ice cream to talk, but he pretty much ignored me. Ice cream, Claire? Are you kidding me? Have you seen the kid? Claire's shoulders sagged. What? I was trying to help. And she was. She was simply ill-equipped. What does mom say? She's concerned, but she's letting dad handle it. Had Hunter heard that correctly? I'm sorry, dad? Since when has dad ever handled anything? Claire glanced quickly around to see who might have overheard. First of all, keep your voice down. Second of all, he's really been trying lately, and Kevin responds to him. Well, as much as Kevin can respond to anyone. She had to laugh, because really? Somehow, I just can't imagine that happening. He's not all bad, Hunter. No one is all one thing. Maybe it's because his health has not been so great, but I've noticed a big change in Dad. He's taken an interest in us, and I, for one, am not going to deny him because of the past. Life is too short. If he wants to turn over a new leaf, let him. Well, that's bullshit. Hunter said. Claire studied her. You really hate him, don't you? How was she supposed to answer that? I'm not a fan, no. For mom's sake, I hope you at least try. Claire headed off to the cake, where the guests were preparing to sing happy birthday to the man of the hour. Hunter scanned the room for Kevin, but he was nowhere to be found. The next morning when Hunter awoke, the smell of bacon and fresh coffee had her smiling before she even opened her eyes. She was home. Her mom was big on breakfast. What she hadn't planned on was the set table she encountered once she'd showered and come downstairs. What's all this? she asked. Her mother smiled. There's my girl. She came around the counter and placed a kiss on Hunter's cheeks. I do think you're even more pretty than the last time you visited. Sweet of you to say, but the jeans come from somewhere. Her mother smiled at the thought and pointed her spatula at Hunter. You're right, I'm pretty good looking myself. She turned back to the sizzling bacon and flipped a strip. I'm bringing sexy back. Hunter laughed nearly spilling the orange juice she poured. I can't believe you just said that. The back door opened, and Claire entered with Chip and their four-year-old twins, Connor and Christopher. The little guys high-fived Hunter on their way into the living room, where their grandma toys were stashed behind the couch, always waiting for their visits. Good morning, everyone, Chip enthused. He tended to speak in exclamation points which Hunter found amusing. Morning, Chip, Hunter answered. Mom's cooking for us. Fancy breakfast time. I can hardly wait. He stared off into the living room, his eyes wide. Christopher, don't hit your brother with that lamp. That's what your grandmother uses to see. Oh, the joys of parenting. Claire took the seat next to Hunter at the table and leaned in. Last night was Star Wars role play, she whispered in her ear. What does that mean? Hunter asked. Claire raised her eyebrows a couple of times pointedly until the meaning of the phrase came into focus. Hunter resisted a blatant face palm and instead nodded and smiled, now picturing her sister in Princess Leia mode against her will. 
Sounds awesome. If you want the rules of rule play, I have them. They're quite simple, though you'll need to identify the aggressor. Last night, it was Chip. Tonight is my turn. God save her from this conversation. You know, I'm good on rules for now, but I'll certainly let you know if I change my mind. Claire winked at her and went about helping their mother finish up breakfast, while Hunter poured juice for the rest of the table. Fifteen minutes later, they were all gathered. Even Kevin, who begrudgingly emerged from his room, again wearing black jeans several sizes too large, and a metal spiked wristband. He set to eating his eggs without so much as a glance at anyone else. Hunter, how are things at the savvy agency these days? Her mother asked. Busy. We had a few projects shuffle, and I think we're just trying to keep up. Her father looked up from his plate. I read an article about the company online. A piece in Time Out? Hold the phone. Her father had not.